In the summer of 2017, 64-year-old grandmother Linda McAllister was pursuing the next phase of her life. She had loving children and grandchildren, a new husband, a new home, and a healthy bank account. Life was good. That was until July of that year, when both she and her husband Chet went missing. Her daughter found the house was in disarray, her 2011 Dodge Ram missing from the driveway. As law enforcement began to piece together what may have happened to the newlyweds, they were drawing closer and closer to the unavoidable conclusion that no one wanted to acknowledge. Could Linda's favorite grandchild be responsible for her death? Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Today's case is a disturbing one. It is a story of greed and selfishness that would be incomprehensible if it were not also so well documented. Let's take a look. On July 8, 2017, Dara Hodge drove out to her mother's house in Conway, South Carolina. She had received a phone call that morning from a contractor hired by her mother, Linda McAllister. The 64-year-old, along with her new husband, William Chet Clemens, were having their home remodeled. But that morning, when the contractor arrived, the newlyweds were nowhere to be found. The sliding door to the home was unlocked. Inside, Dara found Linda's beloved small dogs had the run of the house. And the house was a disaster. The dogs had clearly been left alone for quite some time. Linda and Chet's blue pickup truck was missing from the drive. But if the couple had chosen to drive it from the house, they must have left in a hurry. Calling around, Dara deduced that no one had heard from the couple since July 3rd. They had been missing for five full days. Linda McAllister and Chet Clemens had been married for a year. Despite the age gap, 45-year-old Chet and Linda were reported to be a great match, full of energy and always together. Linda had been married before, for over 10 years, and was the proud mother of two, Dara and her brother James, and she was a grandmother to 11 grandchildren. In the first year of her new marriage, Linda sold her previous home banking a significant balance of over $125,000. She and Chet chose to go through a remodel to set up their new house exactly as they wanted it. This made sense for the couple. They enjoyed staying close to home. They were not the type to spend time away from friends and family. Concerns over Linda and Chet's whereabouts were relieved when Dara spoke with her daughter, Jordan Hodge. Jordan had long been Linda's favorite grandchild. Linda had taken care of a younger Jordan regularly while her parents worked, and they formed a very special bond. Linda's affectionate nickname for Jordan was Little Hodge. Jordan told her mother not to worry. There had been a Clemens family emergency in Ohio, where Chet was from, so the two had left the house in a hurry. Jordan was to stop in and take care of the house and the dogs while they were away. It was clear that the 21-year-old was not doing so, but at least Linda and Chet were perfectly well. They would likely return home in a few days. What puzzled Dara was that she was still unable to reach her mother directly. Her calls rang straight through to voicemail. While she reached out to members of Chet's family to check in, Dara also went out to her mother's house to take another look around. When Dara was first inside the house, she had found the television still on, medication that her mother required left on the bathroom countertop, and items generally displaced across the house. When she returned, the scene was even more unsettling. Items had been moved. A pair of Linda's shoes were now sitting by the back door. Her mother's wallet, emptied of all its contents, was left on the bedside table. A zippered bag that usually contained the couple's deeds and keys to their vehicles was missing. Dara called the police and filed a missing persons report. Then she drove straight out to her daughter's home. Perhaps her mother had returned from Ohio after all and had driven straight to Jordan's. Jordan Hodge had recently moved with her boyfriend, Kenneth Carlisle, 
into a trailer home about 20 minutes from Conway, where her grandmother lived. Making this 20-minute drive, Dara approached her daughter's home. There, she spotted Linda and Chet's blue pickup truck, backed into a partially concealed position behind the other vehicles on the property. Police were called out to speak with Jordan and Kenny Carlisle. The young couple were brought into Ori County Police Station for questioning. Jordan, it seemed, had an answer for everything. Her grandmother had loaned her the truck while they were out of state. She had access to it as well as the house and her grandmother's bank accounts in order to take care of her dogs. Unfortunately, her and Kenny could not let police search the blue pickup truck. They had misplaced the keys. But what's more, Jordan continued to insist that there was no need for concern. Linda McAllister was described by her daughter and closest friends as a hardworking, loving, authoritative, and family-oriented woman who stuck to her routine. Not so claimed her favorite granddaughter. Her grandmother did as she pleased, including picking up and leaving her house without communicating any of this to her children. Kenny Carlisle had a similar story to tell, but he also offered a unique take on Linda and Chet's relationship. Linda's family knew Chet as a sweet and supportive husband, but according to Kenny, this was not the case. Linda was scared of him, he claimed. I was always nervous and shaky, like, scared of him, really. We would yell at her and bounce her around. So he was kind of, he was very, kind of like a hostile personality. He would always tell her, I don't know, she was playing or what, but she was like, well, you know, bitch, I'm punching him out. Don't shut up, I mean, I don't love that. Kenny's exposure to the older couple's marriage would have been considerable. He and Jordan had, for a time, been invited to live with Linda and Chet. The arrangement had fallen apart, however, when $5,000 in cash, intended for the purchase of a new hot tub, went missing from Linda's purse. She believed that Kenny was responsible for taking it. The court-imposed ankle monitor that Kenny had worn since first meeting Jordan had not gone unnoticed by her family. He told the Hodges that he had a pending assault charge stemming from a bar fight, but nothing more serious than that. They did not approve of Kenny Carlisle, and they did not like the person that Jordan was when she was with him. The rift had led to a break in the mother-daughter relationship. Jordan blocked her family and old friends from her phone and social media. She had chosen Kenny Carlisle. By the time Jordan and Kenny sat down with police, Linda and Chet had been missing for 10 days. Investigators seeking to corroborate the young couple's story began tracking their purchases from Linda's accounts over the previous week and a half. According to Jordan, her grandmother had lent her the truck as well as her bank cards between 1 and 2 p.m. on July 4th. She was meant to use Linda's funds to take care of the dogs, but what investigators found were not withdrawals for dog food. Bank records showed the couple used the debit card to withdraw hundreds from four different area banks after July 4th. They were captured via bank security footage, driving their Jeep Cherokee and the blue Dodge Ram pickup truck during that time. Linda had over $75,000 in her bank account in June, but between July 3rd and 13th, over $11,000 was spent by Jordan Hodge and Kenny Carlisle. These withdrawals began a full 12 hours before the time that Jordan claimed to have been given the bank cards. And not a single purchase was made for the dogs. On July 14th, the Ori County Police impounded the Dodge Ram. Inside, they found a mess that rivaled even the one found inside Linda's house. There were fast food bags, bits of food, and random purchases. When it was eventually returned to other family members, they called it a biohazard. This was not only due to the trash. There were visible blood stains on the center console. A set of brand new floor mats sat in the back, their purpose revealed when the original mats were also recovered, with more blood stains. A collection of towels revealed attempts to clean up the scene. 
On pulling back the passenger seat, two 25 caliber casings were located on the floor. Testing later confirmed that the stains and smears were a match to Linda McAllister and William Chet Clemens. Based on cell phone data, the older couple's last known location was the home of Jordan Hodge and Kenny Carlisle. Their house was searched for further evidence as to what had happened to the newlyweds. Detective Calder described the home as in complete disarray. Inside, they found a small two-shot Derringer gun and a Conway National Bank bag, the zippered bag that had held Linda's debit card and car keys. It was stashed in the couple's closet. Outside, the detectives came across a burn pit containing what looked like a cell phone and a gun holster. Several items within the home appeared to be newly purchased merchandise, including a weed whacker, a PlayStation, clothing, drones, and groceries. In addition, Calder said there was just a whole lot of food. Transactions from the local Walmart revealed where much of Linda's funds had been spent. Surveillance footage tracked the couple's movements. Over the 10 days, they purchased items including cheese dip, air conditioning units, frozen pizzas, underwear, gaming systems, and hair dye. Each purchase was topped off with another $100 in cash back. But it was one late night trip at approximately 1.30 a.m. on the morning of July 4th that was of particular interest to Horry County investigators. Jordan and Kenny were captured purchasing a variety of cleaning products, including bleach. GPS tracking from the blue pickup truck had them heading straight from a car wash to the Walmart for these supplies. Before that, the truck had been parked in a nearby wooded area before it was taken to another remote location near to the Bucksville boat landing. Horry County Police were called out to this area on July 15th after several people reported they smelled a foul odor. The trio discovered skeletal remains around 6.15 a.m. and called police, who located the remains under a bush. Testing confirmed that these were the bodies of Linda McAllister and Chet Clemens. The pathologist determined that both were killed by a gunshot to the head. The discovery of the bodies was a devastating blow, made even more difficult for the Hodge family when it was confirmed that Jordan and Kenny had been arrested and charged with the murders. At Jordan's bond hearing, her mother Dara asked the judge to keep both alleged killers in custody. That's my daughter. Right there. And I'm begging you, Your Honor, to get she killed her mother and her husband. At the bond hearing, it became clear that Kenny's ankle monitor was imposed on him for more than just a bar fight. He had been out on bond for offenses in North Carolina. In that state, he faced charges of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill intimidating a witness, assault resulting in bodily harm, injury to property, communicating threats, and two counts each of violating a domestic violence protective order and assault on a female. Kenny Carlisle was also denied bond. There were a few delays as the couple was held in custody awaiting the murder trial. Jordan was exploring a defense that claimed that she was manipulated and pressured into taking part in the killing by her boyfriend. She sat down with a psychologist, Dr. Sharissa Christopher, to be evaluated. Jordan told the doctor that she had been present when her grandmother and step-grandfather had been shot, but she had not pulled the trigger. She said that she felt coerced or pushed to help cover up the murders after they had taken place. She had assisted in moving both victims into the blue truck, but had otherwise taken on a minimal role in the events. Jordan further claimed that she had suffered from hallucinations. Dr. Christopher determined that Jordan Hodge did not have any psychological issues, 
She told the judge that she believed Jordan's hallucinations were the result of a substance abuse issue with drugs and alcohol. I mean, it's my opinion that she has a sufficient factual knowledge of the proceedings. She understands rationally um, what the proceedings are and what her options are, and that she has the ability to work with her attorney. The judge determined that Jordan Hodge was competent to stand trial. Following the competency determination, the state offered plea deals to both alleged killers, 60 years apiece in prison. If convicted in a jury trial, they faced 30 years to life. They both rejected the plea deal. The case went to trial in the autumn of 2019. The defendants were tried together. They are saying that she shot and killed her grandmother. That's what they're saying. There will not be one iota of proof that that ever happened. A witness who the solicitor's office requested remain anonymous testified that he sold two guns to Jordan and Kenny on two separate occasions in 2017. The first, a 25 caliber gun in May and a 40 caliber gun in July. Detective Calder testified that Linda and Chet have been killed by gunshots to the head. The gun that was used has never been identified. At that present time, at there, we started looking around. Um, yes, we noticed injuries to the one skull that did have what appeared to be a gunshot wound to the skull. Much of the testimony centered around the couple's actions in the days following the murders. The jury watched video footage of Jordan and Kenny at some points smiling while they made multiple shopping trips to Walmart. The total daily purchase on this receipt uh, for merchandise is going to be $704.21, and then there's $100 cash back. Both Jordan and Kenny declined to testify in their defense. The direct evidence against them the blood in the truck and the GPS tracking data, taken in conjunction with the wealth of circumstantial evidence, their shopping spree, the lies to family and police, was a damning case. Both defense teams argued that there was no evidence of who pulled the trigger, or that either one of them ever did. Indeed, they had never found the murder weapon. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that we are in the truck, Mr. Carlisle and Ms. Hodge with Mr. Clemens and Ms. McAllister. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that's true. And Mr. Carlisle pulls out a gun out of nowhere and shoots both of them. Does that make Jordan Hodge guilty of murder? Absolutely not. She was innocent when she walked into this courtroom. She is innocent as she sits there at this moment. And she is innocent until and unless you, the 12 of you, become satisfied otherwise. But they're not really sure what happened because they weren't there. That's why there are two people sitting here. That's why two people are on trial. And I will tell y'all, they don't have to show who shot them. Before this trial, that may have surprised you. You may have thought when you sat down and found out you were going for a murder trial, there was going to be an eyewitness who came in here and said, I saw blah, 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 shoot blah, 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 with a blah, blah, blah. Well, there was no blah, blah, blah. And they don't have to have that. 100% right on that. Judge told you that. They can proceed under a theory called hand of one is hand of ball. The case was based on the principle of hand of one is hand of all, which essentially means that if two people work together to commit a crime, both are responsible for the acts of the other. The jury of eight men and four women deliberated for 90 minutes. They convicted both Jordan Hodge and Kenny Carlisle of first degree murder. At the sentencing hearing, Dara Hodge spoke about the immense loss that was felt by her whole family by the death of her mother. She was also losing a daughter. While Kenny declined to speak on his behalf at the hearing, his mother pled for mercy. Conversely, Dara Hodge 
asked the judge to apply the maximum sentence for her 22-year-old daughter. Jordan begged for leniency. Both she and her ex-boyfriend were given life sentences without the possibility of parole. My mom wore her heart on her sleeve. Yeah. And that's why they leached in. Sure. Period. Took full advantage of he took advantage. the heart that her mom had. And I'm very proud of my sister for asking for that, for that life sentence. I um, love her unconditionally. But, her father loves her unconditionally. It was the hardest things we ever had to go through in our life. So teenagers, you know when we listen to parents think twice? You want their black fur. At the time of publication, Jordan Hodge is 28 years old and serving out her sentence in South Carolina. Her mother has spoken publicly about the manipulation that she believes her daughter experienced at the hands of her first real boyfriend, Kenny Carlisle. Kenny is also serving out his life sentence. He is 34 years old. And that was the tragic case of Linda McAllister and her new husband, Chet Clements. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.